tonight, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, we bring you the story of someone who's never shown his face on television before, and for good reason. Ali Sufan was one of the FBI's secret weapons in its fight against Al-Qaeda. A Lebanese-American, fluent in Arabic, he interrogated Al-Qaeda prisoners at secret locations all over the world. Sufan was known for his ability to outwit terrorists, and he's telling his story in a new book, The Black Banners, parts of which have been blacked out because the CIA says they contain classified information. On the day of the September 11th attacks, Ali Sufan was thousands of miles away from Ground Zero, but in a unique position to help find those responsible. The story will continue in a moment. What was your first thought? It was Al-Qaeda. Absolutely, I had no doubt in my mind. I had no doubt in my mind. Two planes at the same time hitting the World Trade Center. On 9-11, FBI agent Ali Sufan was in Yemen, where his New York-based team had been investigating the deadly Al-Qaeda attack a year earlier on the USS Cole. Sufan and his team were preparing to fly back to New York when FBI headquarters ordered him and his partner to stay put. And at this point, every fiber of your being is screaming, I've got to get back to yeah, New York. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. I said, you know, uh, New York is under attack, America under attack. We can investigate the call some other time. And the answer was, no, Ali, it's not about the call. It's, it's actually about what happened here. And I was feeling uh, like a knife going on my heart. I, I felt, what did we miss? What did we miss? Sufan wondered whether he and his team had missed some hint of the 9-11 plot as they investigated the earlier attack on the coal. And his mission in Yemen now took on a new urgency. There were already a number of Al-Qaeda operatives in custody in Yemen. And for the FBI, Ali Sufan was the right man to question them about 9-11. He had been investigating Al-Qaeda for four years and knew a lot about its operatives and its ideology. He was fluent in Arabic, a Muslim himself, and at 30 years old, starting to make a name for himself as one of the Bureau's best interrogators of Islamic extremists. What makes a good interviewer or interrogator? Knowledge and empathy. I think these are the two things. You need to connect with people on a human level, uh, regardless if they don't like you, if they want to kill you. Is it hard to have empathy with someone who's just killed or helped to kill thousands of Americans? Oh, absolutely. I was with one guy who's telling me he want to slaughter me like a sheep. What did you say to him? I kind of like politely put him in his place. I would like to understand what politely put him in his place means. We had a fruit next to us and there was a knife to cut the fruit. I gave him the knife. I said, go ahead and do it now. He looked at me and said, I thought so. So sit down and shut your mouth and let's talk. Are they trying to turn the situation around? Are they trying to turn it on well, you? Well, you know what? There is something that they don't expect when they are, they are being interrogated by Americans. They don't expect a person comes with them, they have like tea, they have coffee, sit down, talk, trying to know each other, trying to build rapport. And that scares them, that shakes them. Because they were trained that we are so evil and we torture and we kill. And that is the reason of the rage against us. So they tell you a lot of stuff to piss you off, and then they can say, see, he is evil. So yeah, um, in my case, I tried to deprive them from that. Do you think the fact that you were a Muslim gave you an advantage in some cases and in some ways? No, but the fact that uh, maybe I understood the culture, the fact that uh, I genuinely, as a person, have an interest in these kind of things, that would probably help me. There's been times where you've got into really deep religious right. arguments with some pretty high-level bad guys. Well, it happened frequently, yeah. Did you win those arguments? Well, I don't know if I convinced them, um, but I know towards the end I have my confession, and that's what I cared about. <laughs> Just one week after 9-11, Sufan and his partner found themselves face-to-face -face with Osama bin Laden's bodyguard, Abu Jandal. He had been caught and imprisoned in Yemen nearly seven months before 
But now that bin Laden had attacked on U.S. soil, it was important to see if Abu Jandal could help the FBI build a case against those responsible. He walked, sat on his chair, and literally moved the chair towards the two Yemeni interrogators that's there. And he said, I don't acknowledge them. I don't acknowledge their existence. And why is he doing that? He hate us. He hate America. So how did you get him to open up? Well, it was a process. We were able to build a rapport with him. And uh, he talked a lot about, uh, you know, revolutions and the history of revolutions. So I started telling him about the American Revolution, too. And uh, we got him a book in Arabic about George Washington and the American Revolution that he actually stayed all night reading. Uh, he was fascinated by it. But he's practicing a typical counter-interrogation technique where he gives you what he thinks you know, so you will think he's cooperating. Sufan says when Abu Jandal looked at a book of photos of known al-Qaeda members, he identified very few and kept passing over the photo of this man, Marwan al-Shihi, one of the 9-11 hijackers. Safan knew Abu Jandal had cared for El Shihi years ago when he was very sick. So, so the fact that he was not identifying him immediately was a signal to you right. that he was not being honest. Exactly. So I said to him, um, so you want to tell me you don't know this guy? Kandahar, December 1999, Ramadan, he got very sick. You were nursing him and putting soup on his lips so he won't get dehydrated. I took the book. I said, let me make it very clear to you. You don't know how many people in the book works for me. You don't know how many people in the book we caught, and they're cooperating. And that is the card that I have to know if you're cooperating or not. So why don't you look at the book again? He identified almost everyone in the book. Among those Abu Jandal identified as al-Qaeda members were seven of the terrorists who flew planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Abu Jandal didn't know they'd been involved in the 9-11 plot because he'd been in prison, and he insisted that al-Qaeda was not behind the attack. He didn't believe it. He, he was very adamant that bin Laden didn't do it. So what happens then? And I said, well, I know that al-Qaeda did that. Someone told me. He said, who told you? I said, you did. And he gets so mad, like, you're putting words in my mouth. I never said Al-Qaeda did that. I said, do you want to know who flew the planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon? And I took the seven photos that he identified and put it in front of him. I said, those, my friend, are not my sources. Those are the people who flew the planes. He totally collapsed. He, he collapsed? He put his hands like this on his face and went down. And he started shaking. He knew what he did. He, he knew that he... He just gave up bin Laden. He just gave up al-Qaeda on 9-11. And after that, the level of cooperation was very different. Uh, we ended up spending days and days with him. Abu Jandal provided nearly 100 pages of information, according to Sufan's FBI report, including intricate details about al-Qaeda's training facilities, communications, and weaponry. It was quite an achievement for someone who might best be described as an accidental FBI agent. Sufan grew up in Lebanon during that country's brutal civil war, and he moved with his family to the U.S. when he was 17. He was a frat boy at Mansfield University in Pennsylvania, planning a career in academia, when a college administrator suggested he apply for a job with the FBI. When he said that, I was like, as if he was telling me, you're going to be like in the circus or you're going to be a you know, race car driver. I mean, what? FBI, what are you talking about, you know? People were laughing, my friends. Your frat brothers. Yeah, were laughing. I'm like, you know, the, the, they will send you back the application. A little bit of me. a challenge. I mean, I, I was like, okay. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> In 1997, after getting a master's degree in international relations, he joined the FBI's New York office as a rookie counterterrorism agent. And he was little more than three years on the job when he was made the case agent for the FBI's investigation of the attack on the USS Cole. In March 2002, the U.S. captured its first high-value terrorist operative, Abu Zubaydah, after a firefight in Pakistan. Ali Sufan and his partner were called in to assist in the CIA interrogation at a secret location in Thailand. Abu Zubaydah was severely wounded, but still able to communicate. 
From U.S. intelligence files, Sufan had learned a lot about Abu Zubaydah, and he told us that he put that knowledge to good use right away. When uh, I first met him, I asked him his name, and he gave me a fake name, a Daoud. different name, Dawood. And uh, I said to him, what if I call you honey? And the look on his face was like, oh, you know, like, oh, you, know, I, uh, you know, that's it, yeah, it's over. And he just looked at me, and he just shook his head. He was shocked. Well, honey is the name that his mother uh, called him as a child. So he knew that I know everything about him. Why do you think it mattered so much? It kind of told him that you cannot play games with us. We know who you are. And what do you think is the most important information that came out of that? The most important information is identifying Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as a mastermind of 9-11. At the time, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, or KSM, was on the FBI's most wanted list for other terrorist plots. U.S. intelligence suspected he was involved in 9-11, but the FBI didn't have any evidence of that. Ali Sufan and his partner, Steve Godin, meant to show Abu Zubaydah a photo of someone else on the most wanted list. But they showed Abu Zubaydah this photo of KSM by mistake. He looks at me and he says, don't play games with me, brother. Don't play games with me. You know who this guy. This is... This is Mukhtar. This is a mastermind of uh, the plane operations. Of 9-11? That's what the Qaeda called 9-11, the plane operations. Mukhtar, that's Mukhtar. the name he uses? That was the alias for KSM. Did you know that? No, I had no idea. Um, the only thing I knew at the time, I'm looking for a Mukhtar. So when he said Mukhtar, it kind of like clicked. I looked at it and said, oh, Steve, you gave me the wrong photo. And I gave it to Steve so he will know who the mastermind of 9-11 is. You're playing it very cool, but what's going through your head, really? Holy sh**, KSM is uh, <laughs> a Qaeda guy and he masterminded 9-11? It was an accident? Totally. Totally. Sufan says he believes Abu Zubaydah didn't mean to divulge important information and was trying to give up as little as possible. So was he well-versed in counterintelligence? Yes, he's, he's definitely well-versed in counterintelligence, uh, counter-interrogation. Uh, he's a smart. Um, he is, I can actually say, borderline genius. Uh, you know, I, I hear a lot of people saying he's an idiot. He's, no, he's, he's probably one of the smartest people I interrogated. Sufan thought he and his partner were making progress, but he says everything abruptly changed after 10 days when he was told to stop talking to Abu Zubaydah. The CTC team, the Counterterrorism Center team, um, arrived. Uh, of the CIA? Of the CIA. So we told them from our perspective that uh, he has been cooperating. We just get information that uh, KSM is a mastermind of uh, 9-11. Um, they said, well... Yeah, but there's a belief that uh, there's a lot more information and he's not uh, giving it up yet. So uh, it ended up that there's a plan already decided in Washington that was basically to strategically diminish his ability to resist, as, uh, as the term was used. Um, we knew that we're going down on a path that's a dangerous path, a path that we haven't been on before. So uh, we had to pull out from the interrogation, and we had to uh, start witnessing uh, something that was really surprising, some technique that we never thought that we will see us doing. The new techniques Ali Sufan is talking about included nudity, sleep deprivation, and loud music. It was the beginning of the tough and controversial methods that would ultimately include waterboarding and become known as enhanced interrogation techniques. What Ali Sufan witnessed and what he did about it when we come back.